And um, I'm just going to go through this example. We've already looked at this, but I felt we, ru I felt we rushed it. So I wanted to look at it in a bit more detail today. Basically, I've got here um, uh, interest rates, which are bank rates, um, treasury bill rates. I've also got the yield on government bonds. So I'm just going to extend this a little bit and look for whether or not there are co-integrating vectors between these three interest rates. Okay? You can think of these as three interest rates with longer maturities. The bank rate is the shortest. Um, the uh, treasury bill rate is a three month rate. The bond yield is um, a long dated government security. Um, uh, so uh, what we're going to look at is whether or not there is a co-integrating vector between these three variables. Well, it's actually very easy to do in eViews. I'm just going to type in the following. Show bank rate, treasury bill rate, and bond yield. Okay. There we go. Okay. That brings up the spreadsheet view. Now, if we want to test for a co-integrating relationship between these variables, we can use the um, Johansson test. Strictly speaking, I should have checked that they're all I1 series in the first place, so I should have checked that they've got unit roots. Um, if you do the test, you will find that individually these series um, uh, uh, do have random walk elements, so it, um, it would be an issue. Okay, so if I want to do the Johansson test, I go to View, okay, move down to Co-integration test here, and we've got Johansson System Co-integration test. That's the one I'm going to opt for. Okay, we get lots of options here. The safest one is usually to assume the default one. I'm certainly not going to spend a lot of time going through them here. Click on OK. Okay, and this is the kind of output it will give you. Okay, so when it does the Johansson test, what it does is it estimates that VECM. It estimates the vector error correction model, and then it takes the pi matrix, and it uses the pi matrix as the basis for constructing tests for co-integration. Okay, the tests are not applied directly to the pi matrix, it's actually a transformation of it, but um, it's whether or not those elements of the pi matrix are significant or not that really matters. The way it works is as follows. Okay, we start off with the um, hypothesis that there are no co-integrating relationships, that these series are essentially just um, uh, random walks with no uh, equilibrium or co-integrating relationship between them. So we start off with the null hypothesis here that there are no CEs or co-integrating equations. So this is our first null hypothesis here that there are no co-integrating relationships. On the basis of that pi matrix, it calculates a test statistic for whether or not that null hypothesis is correct. The first one here is the trace test statistic here. And then it compares that with a set of critical values that are, um, uh, you can find in various papers. They're known as the McKinnon critical values, or more precisely the mckinnon hogg michaelis critical values. And we decide whether or not there are any co-integrating equations. Okay, so the first null hypothesis here, the test statistic is 30.7 and the 5% critical value is 29.7. So we would conclude that we reject the null hypothesis there and conclude that there is at least one co-integrating relationship. But of course, if we've got um, a, um, a, a system of equations like this, it's possible there may be more than one. So we then move on to the null hypothesis that there is at most one co-integrating relationship. The test statistic here is 8.8 .8, and the 5% critical value here is 15.49. So we can't reject the null hypothesis that there is at most one co-integrating vector. So we would conclude here that in fact there is a single co-integrating relationship between these three variables. And that's summarised for you here, where it tells us that the trace test indicates one co-integrating equation at the 5% level. Okay? Now, if we move down a little, okay, so if I just move down a little here, okay, 
it does a second test for us. This is based on the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay. And um, generally, these will give you similar results. Both these tests should give you very similar results. We start off with a null hypothesis that there are no cointegrating vectors. The test statistic is 21.85, so we conclude uh, and we compare that with a crystal value of 21.13. So we reject that null hypothesis. There is at least one cointegrating vector. We then move on to the null hypothesis that there is at most one cointegrating vector. The test statistic here is 6.969. The critical value is 14.26. So we can't reject the null hypothesis that there is at most one cointegrating vector. So again, the maximum eigenvalue test here is indicating one cointegrating equation at the 5% level. Okay? So the tests agree with each other. Both of them are confirming the existence of one cointegrating vector. Okay. It does here give you cointegrating coefficients. You have to do a little bit of work to actually work out what the relationship is. But if you notice here, this first cointegrating coefficients, this first row here, these two are nearly equal and opposite in sign. What this indicates is that the cointegrating relationship is actually one in which the treasury bill rate moves on a one-to-one -one basis with the um, bank rate. Okay, that's the nature of that cointegrating relationship. Okay, so the Johansson test is a very useful test. For one thing, it's argued that it's a more powerful test than the Engel-Granger test for cointegration. Okay. Earlier on, we looked at Engel-Granger tests where we just looked for a single cointegrating relationship between non-stationary variables. One of the problems with that is that sometimes, with the Engel-Granger test, it's hard to reject the null hypothesis even when the null hypothesis is false. Okay, It's not a particularly powerful test, whereas, and arguably, the Johansson test is a more powerful test. It's easier to detect the presence of genuine cointegrating relationships using this test than with the Engel-Granger test. Okay, let's ask if anybody's got any questions there. No? Okay, right. Well, in that case, I shall move on to my next topic, okay, which we didn't do in the last lecture. What I could do is I could do this using the um, the var command. Okay, so if I estimate a var here, okay, so if I um, uh, set up an object here, new object var, click on OK, and for simplicity, I'm just going to assume a var that links bank rate. to the treasury bill rate. Okay. Now, it's giving me the default here of two lags uh, on the right-hand side, so I'm going to stick with the default here um, for illustrative purposes, just stick with two lags. So click on OK, and it estimates the VAR here. Okay. Um, usually we can look at the VAR and we can uh, get some idea of whether or not there will be um, Granger causality by just looking at these t-ratios and the square brackets here and whether or not there are significant effects of the likes coming through here. So for example in the treasury bill rate equation the second lag of bank rates comes through with a significant coefficient. Here the t-ratio is minus 3.6. In the bank rate equation the first lag of the treasury bill rates comes through with a significant coefficient here. The t-ratio is 6.43. Okay, so if I um, scan down a little more, okay, the second lags don't seem to be significant there of the treasury bill rate, but I would say just looking at that, I strongly suspect that there will be Granger causality here. But because we've got two lags of each variable on the right hand side, what we're going to need to do here is an F test for the joint significance of these lags. So, for example, if we want to test whether or not the treasury bill rate Granger causes the bank rate, we would test for the joint significance of TBR minus 1 and TBR minus 2. If we want to test for whether or not the, treasury, um, um, the bank rate Granger causes the treasury bill rate, 
we would test for the joint significance of bank rate minus one and bank rate minus two in the treasury bill rate equation. Okay, of course it does these things automatically for you. So if we go to view here, okay, and we look at lag structure, we've got here Granger causality or block exogeneity test as it calls them. So if I click on that, okay, it's done the two sets of Granger causality tests here. Actually, it does a chi-squared test rather than an F-test here, but um, <coughs> essentially it's the same thing. Um, the chi-squared test is just a large sample version. So here, for example, in the bank rate equation, we test for whether or not excluding the treasury bill rate um, lags as a significant effect. This gives us a chi-squared statistic of 82.5 with degrees of freedom 2. Now, off the top of my head, the um, critical value there is about 5.9 something, it's close to 6, so it's way over the critical value. So we will conclude there that the treasury bill rate, Granger causes the bank rate. Similarly, if we look at the treasury bill rate equation, we test whether or not excluding the bank rate lags has a significant effect on the current value of the treasury bill rate. That gives us a chi-squared statistic of 15.27, Again, with two degrees of freedom, because there are two variables that we're excluding. And again, the critical value is going to be 5.9 something. we again rejecting the null hypothesis there. So Granger causality tests are very, very easy to apply. We just estimate the VAR. It will do these tests for us automatically. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Great stuff. Right, well, let me move on then. So, first thing, uh, uh, let me just of all stop the... So, as I say, this occurs a lot in um, financial time series. And what I've got here is a data set that consists of daily data for the returns uh, for the share price on a variety of different um, financial assets. So if I just show you what the data set consists of, it consists of daily closing prices for a variety of companies. These are all companies that are quoted on the London Stock Exchange. I've got you know, a variety of different companies, uh, the Abbey National Bank, British Airways, Bass Breweries and so on. And I've also got data on the market as a whole, which is modelled by the FTSE 100 index. Okay. Now you're probably already familiar with the idea of what we call a market model. A market model is where we model the returns on a particular share as being a function of the returns on the market as a whole. Okay. So let me just show you how we'd estimate a simple market model based on this data. If I wanted to, say, estimate a market model for um, Abbey National shares, I would do, regress the change in the log of Abbey National closing price on a constant and the change in the log of the FTSE. Okay, that would give me a market model for um, the Abbey National. So the first difference, the logarithm here, is basically the um, uh, 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 proportional change in price, the percentage change in price. So it measures the day-on-day -day returns on holding these shares. And what we're saying here is if we look at this regression, then if this is the return on holding Abbey National shares, that's equal to this constant term here, plus 1.08 multiplied by the, uh, the return on an overall market portfolio, if we're using the FTSE to measure the market portfolio as a whole, okay? And so what we're saying is that if the market goes up by 1%, um, then Abbey National shares on average go up by 1.08% the return, okay? Sorry, it's the returns, not the price. It's a, so this is a relationship in returns here, okay? Now, can I just again just ask, have you seen this type of model before on your other courses, your finance courses? Oh, come on, I'm sure you have at some stage, okay, because it's a very, it, uh, but even if you haven't, it really is a very easy model to sort of um, get to grips with. It's basically just saying, um, what's the relationship between the returns on a particular um, share to the market as a whole, okay? 
And we do pick up quite a significant effect, you can see. The returns on the market as a whole, um, uh, uh, the T statistic here is 22. So we're picking up a very significant effect, okay? And we're picking up an R squared of 0.27. So basically we're saying that the, volat uh, the variance in returns on our national shares, about 27% of that is being explained by movements in the market as a whole, okay? And the rest of it is down to particular factors that affect Abbey National, but don't affect all the other shares. Yeah. I should say, by the way, Abbey National doesn't really exist anymore. Um, this is Santander nowadays. So, so Santander took over Abbey National um, some time ago. But um, this data set um, go, uh, um, uh, goes back a fair way. Okay. Now, this is typical of the type of data set which um, will give us um, arch effects, okay? How do we know that? Well, if we do a test for arch, I can go to view here, then look at residual diagnostics and look at heteroscedasticity tests, okay? Then if I move down to arch here, ask me for the number of lags. Well, I'm just going to take the default here and take one lag, so test for a first order arch process. What it does is it takes the residuals from that first stage regression, okay, and it um, uh, it runs a, re a regression of the squared residuals on a constant and the lag squared residuals, okay. So what it's doing is it's now testing for whether or not these lag squared residuals are significant in this auxiliary regression. There are actually a whole diff uh, set of different ways we can test for this. Um, you know, the straightforward t-test would give you a, a t-statistic of 7.57, so obviously that's significant. Um, but if you look at the top here, it's also done the f-test here, 57.3, okay, with a p-value that's effectively zero. And it's also done a chi-squared test. All of them are telling us the same story. Um, the, there is evidence here of autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. Okay, there's an arch effect going on in the residuals here. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, let me just do one further thing on this. So if I just move back to the equation, first of all, so I click on stats and the, uh, move back to my basic equation. The other thing that's kind of interesting here is that whenever we get arch effects, we typically also get non-normality in the residuals. You can test for non-normality by doing the Jacques-Bera test. If you go to view here, okay, and you look at um, a, okay, residual diagnostics, look at histogram normality test, this gives you a plot of the histogram of the residuals. Okay, now actually that looks pretty symmetric. You just look at that graph, it looks the sort of shape you would expect to find um, for a normally distributed variable. But when we get arch, when we get an autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity, typically there will be a lot more observations out here in the tails of the distribution than we would expect to find in a um, normally distributed um, random variable. Okay? So if you look at the formal test for um, uh, uh, normality, this is the, uh, provided here by the jacques Bera test. Now, um, I'm not going to go into that here, um, but basically, the jacques Bera test, um, under the null hypothesis that the re uh, residuals are normally distributed, follows a chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom. Okay? So its critical value is going to be about 5.9. So we've got a jacques Bera test of 634, that is absolutely huge. It's indicating that there is, uh, these are not normally distributed. The reason that they're not normally distributed is that there are too many observations out in the tails of the distribution. And this is something that's very often associated with arch processes in the errors. Okay? It's also something that's very often associated with financial time series. Financial time series models very often have not uh, uh, um, uh, residuals and errors that don't follow a normal distribution. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, right, well in that case I'm going to move on to my next slide.
Sorry, you do have a question. Yeah. Yes. I don't, okay, um, yeah, the question was how do I tell whether it's a first order arch process or a higher order arch process? The answer is I don't know it in advance, okay, what I would have to do is test for progressively higher order arch processes. What I would say is that in many situations a first order arch process is generally enough, but it's actually fairly straightforward to just extend it, okay, so um, let me just do that. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, sorry, go back to view here. If I wanted to test for a higher order arch process, I would go to heteroscedasticity test arch, and then I could say set it for four lags. Okay, this would be a fourth order arch process. Click on OK. Okay, now if I look at the auxiliary regression here, there are four squared lagged residual terms here, and actually the second order one is significant, and the fourth order one is significant, so actually a fourth order arch process might be more appropriate here. Okay? Yep. So the only way, really, is to do the test, is the answer. Okay. Anything else? Okay, right. Well, let's move on then. Um, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how we actually deal with this. So, I'm going to choose a different company here. I'm going to estimate a um, market model for ICI. Okay. So I regress D log ICI on a constant and D log FTSE. That's my least squares estimate here. Okay. Now you see, just looking at this, um, the um, uh, return on the market has got a coefficient of 0.665, a T statistic of eight of 11.89. So it is pretty significant. Okay, but actually the um, the R squared is pretty low, 0 0.098. That's not necessarily anything to worry about, because um, remember these are returns. So, um, in fact, um, what we're trying to do here is explain a highly volatile series. If you look at the series, just look at the residuals, the actual and fitted values, we're trying to explain that red series there, that red line, okay? That's the day-on-day -day returns on holding ICI shares. It's a highly volatile series. We fitted a model to it, the fit is given by this blue line here, uh, the, this green line here, with the residuals given by this blue series here. Okay, we've had a limited amount of success. We're explaining some of the variants of the series, but it's actually fairly limited. Okay, so don't panic when you estimate models like this and get a fairly low R squared. You're trying to explain an extremely volatile series, so that's one of the reasons why we're getting such. Um, uh, a low R squared. Okay, that's just a little bit of a digression. What we want to do is see whether or not um, we um, uh, um, need to fit a GARCH process to this. Well, first of all, um, let's just establish that we do need to. So I'm just going to do the same test I did before and go to um, do a straightforward test for whether or not there is an ARCH process in the residuals. Okay, so I've gone the same steps that I did before, and that I've run a test for um, first order arch process. So I've regressed the squared residuals on a constant of the lag squared residuals, and you can see that all my tests are giving me um, evidence that there is a significant arch effect here. Okay, the F statistic in particular here, 17.01, with a p value of zero, there's strong evidence here of arch. Okay, so how do we deal with it? Well, let me go back to the equation first of all. Okay, so I'll go back to the stats there. That's my OLS estimate. What I want to do now is estimate it allowing for the presence of GARCH, or, or generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity in the residuals. 
Okay. This will change these coefficient estimates. In particular, we're going to see the beta here will change somewhat. Okay. So the beta, remember, measures how the um, return on this share varies with the return on the market as a whole. Okay. But if I want to allow for an arch process, when I click on estimate here, okay, the method, the default method, is set to least squares. If I pull down the box here, you see that one option here is arch, autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. And if I click on that, it will give me a series of options. Okay. The default is a GARCH 1-1. One, one. So you see here, the order of the arch is 1, the order of the GARCH is 1. So that's the, the two parameters that we need to be most careful about setting. What sort of GARCH process are we modelling here? And you'll see the default here is just a straightforward GARCH 1-1 one, one model. Um, um, that's very often what we want to fit. So I'm going to click on OK there. OK. And it's now estimated not just the mean equation, but the variance equation as well. OK. Notice that the mean equation, the beta coefficient has changed because we're now allowing for a GARCH process in the residuals. So we'd expect it to change. It's gone up from about 0 0.66 to 0 0.73. What is interesting here is to look at the um, variance equation. We've got a significant lag squared residual, that's the arch term. And we've got a significant GARCH coefficient. Okay? And if we look at those coefficient values, we see that they add up to something that's very, very close to 1. Again, it's close to being unstable, but it's just under 1. Okay? And as I pointed out before, that's not necessarily... Um, uh, um, unexpected here. We do often get that with this type of model. Okay, so that's how we would allow for the presence of um, generalised autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity in this type of model. And as I say, this is very often a feature with high frequency financial time series. Here we've applied it to daily data for um, uh, the uh, equity market, we've estimated a market model and um, we find evidence of a significant arch process in the residuals. Yes, please. I think they actually add up to over one. Um, they may do just about. <laughs> okay, yeah, I would. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. It's so close, yes, uh, they could, it, uh, as they point out here, if we take these two coefficients. I think it's virtually exactly one. It's virtually just dead on one. Okay. <laughs> this is the danger of actually doing um, something without actually checking it out first. Okay. <laughs> right. I can't give you an answer there. I can't, I can't solve this problem. I'd have to look through it a bit further. Okay. Right. So, having got that out of the way, let's, uh, let's move back to the slides for just consider a few more issues here. Okay, so given that um, ICI did not work to my advantage last time, I'm going to choose a different company. Uh, um, again, um, to just introduce a bit of randomness into it, um, I'm going to consider another company that I haven't considered yet, and that's Cadbury Schweppes. Okay, that's a company that makes uh, lots of chocolates and soft drinks. Okay, so what I'm going to do is estimate a market model for Cadbury Schweppes. Okay. And if I estimate it by OLS, that's my basic market model for Cadbury Schweppes. And I've got a beta coefficient of 0.577 here. Okay, so if the, market, uh, the return on the market goes up by 1%, then the return on Cadbury Schweppes goes up by 0.577%. Okay? Right. So, tend to think there will probably be um, a, uh, some sort of arch process going on here. So let's just do a quick test for that. So if we just do a test for an arch process, we would go to residual diagnostics, heteroscedasticity tests, 
and click on Arch. Okay, and like just about every financial series you can do, uh, every financial series you can investigate, um, you're probably going to find some evidence of Arch here. And you see that we do, it's no exception. We get an F statistic here of 50.11, so we're going to reject the, uh, the null that there's no Arch process in the residuals. Okay, so I'm now going to go, I'm going to allow for the presence of Arch here by going back to estimate and allowing for here an Arch process and the default is an Arch 1-1 process. Okay, so um, this is a straightforward symmetric Arch process okay because it makes no distinction whether or not we have positive or negative shocks so our mean equation here you see the beta coefficient has changed a little bit um, and we've got a, um, a, a variance equation here again with significant um, uh, squared like squared residuals and the like the arch term there okay um, I'm just doing the sums in my head and these do seem to be slightly less than one now if we take the uh, we sum those up which is uh, um, what I want to find okay so now suppose I want to test whether or not this is a symmetric arch process or whether or not positive and negative shocks have got different effects we've got asymmetric arch okay how would I do that well if I go back to my estimate command here then the default was a straightforward arch 1 1 process okay now what i can do is change the model here and allow for the presence of a an arch process a, 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 um, a an asymmetric process here okay and to do that okay we we'll click on that there okay you can see that we it, it allows for eg arch parch okay so i'm going to allow for an eg arch effect here click on OK okay and that now allows for an asymmetric effect now the coefficient that's relevant for the asymmetric gauge here is the C5 coefficient okay and if the C5 coefficient is significant that would indicate a significant asymmetric effect well in fact the C5 coefficient has a coefficient a T ratio of <coughs> minus 1.7 it's not significant at the 5% level. So again, we've tested here for an asymmetric effect. There isn't any, okay? So it's actually very consistent with what we saw on the slides with Vodafone, where we have uh, saw there was no evidence for asymmetric gauge. There's no evidence for asymmetric gauge here. Okay, so um, let me just um, shut this down. Okay, so I'm just going to stop recording there.